Hi, my name is Tensha and I'm a research engineer on the prediction team here at Zoox. Hi, my name is Yannick. I'm a senior staff engineer in the planning and controls team. Today, we'll be taking you on a freeway drive from the Slack facility at Stanford University up the 280 to our office in San Francisco on Embarcadero. And as usual, the drive is fully autonomous without any human intervention from when the driver switches to autonomy. Cool, let's go. Note that the vehicle icon changes from gray to white to signify that the safety driver has switched the vehicle from manual to autonomous mode. The drive you will see was recorded in February this year, so it was before the shelter in place. And uh, you will notice that it was speed up quite a bit. The speed up factor changes throughout the video and is shown in the top left corner. You might have noticed how we slowed down for the speed bump here. Even though our suspension could easily take the bump with 25 miles an hour, we decided to take it very carefully in order to not disturb the passenger. Driving comfort is very important to us. As we approach a junction with multiple traffic lights controlling different lanes, it's important to know which traffic light controls our lane in particular. This is one of the reasons we pre-map all locations that we drive so that our vehicle understands exactly how we should react to each combination of traffic lights and other static road features. You will soon see how our vehicle merges onto the freeway, a maneuver that can be quite challenging in dense traffic. Then it more or less immediately changes onto the second from the right lane to avoid having to deal with other cars merging onto the freeway ahead. Let me point out that this is not a pre-planned lane change, but rather the result of what we call the action search inside the planner. Part of that is that it continuously checks which lane looks most promising and then chooses to change into that lane if it's worth it. Even though freeway driving is in general less complex and more structured and thus less exciting than urban driving, we still frequently test here. This is to ensure that our AI stack is capable of handling all possible speed ranges up to 65 miles an hour. Cut-ins, that is the process of somebody changing lanes in front of our vehicle, can be tricky to handle sometimes, especially when cars ahead are slower than you or braking. On the one hand, you want to leave enough space between yourself and the other vehicle. On the other hand, you don't just want to slam the brakes. As you can see here, we handled this one pretty smoothly. Our vehicles always adhere to the posted speed limit, even if the traffic around us is driving faster than that. In addition, it is important to stay consistently within our lane, which is impossible at freeway speeds using only a GPS signal as its resolution is not precise enough. Our team has built an amazing system that accomplishes this by combining LiDAR localization with GPS, inertial motion data, and vehicle odometry to give highly accurate location results even under challenging conditions. Something else that happens at higher speeds is that the same latency between perception and planning results in a much higher precision error for entities surrounding us if you don't account for it. For example, at 65 miles per hour, a latency of 250 milliseconds results in a position error of about 6 meters. To account for this, our planner considers the output of our prediction system instead of the last perception measurement, which helps us to drive this error down to almost zero. People sometimes wonder what this white carpet represents. In short, that is what we call the driving corridor, and it constrains the drivable area to the left and the right. You can see that we allow our vehicle to go a little bit into the adjacent lanes, as long as there are no vehicles around us. The green line on the ground represents the decision trajectory projected onto the ground. One of the challenges on the highway is localization, which is the process of finding our own position within the map. The localizer works based on distinct features, almost like a human does it. Obviously, there is less of those on the highway compared to the city, where you have buildings, side roads or even small hints like hydrants. I remember that even our experts were surprised about how accurate we still localized back in the days when we did our first highway runs. It's important to understand the difference between static and moving objects. You can see how static objects, such as the divider in the center of the freeway, are represented in the bottom panel in gray. We predict the future actions of moving objects such as vehicles by considering their past locations, 
velocity, and motion on the road to form a probability distribution representing what they might do in the next few seconds. You can see that our vehicle decided to make a proactive lane change further away from the right shoulder here. Again, this is not a scripted maneuver, but rather the result of a continuous evaluation of the best lane to be in. Due to our map, the planner knows that the right lane ends in a couple hundred meters, and in its internal weighting, the new lane wins and triggers the lane change. Here you can see how a few cars merge onto the highway, and due to our lane selection, we are more or less able to avoid having to deal with them right away. If you're watching closely, you'll notice here that we're not only tracking all of the traffic traveling in our direction, we're additionally doing the same for all of the traffic on the other side of the freeway traveling south. Though this traffic should not affect us, it is still important to have 360 degree scene awareness in case any other agent does something unexpected. When driving through an underpass, pedestrians, bikes or cars that are crossing the highway must not be assumed to be on the highway. We use our ground height information in combination with our map to understand that they are actually not driving or walking on the highway. When driving at higher speeds, it becomes very important to be able to accurately detect vehicles at longer distances and to know how fast they are going. In particular, it is important to know if a vehicle ahead of us is in our lane or not and whether any vehicle in our lane is stopped or going very slowly. For example, here we're able to detect that the two vehicles ahead of us are not in our lane and are going at highway speeds even though they are both over 200 meters away. Our sensor stack uses a combination of radar, lidar, and camera data to accomplish this by leveraging the strengths of each modality, the high resolution of camera data, the extremely accurate distance measurements of lidar, and radial velocity from radar. Right here we're going through an underpass again and it can be considered being a tunnel where you don't have any GPS connection. Still, we are able to localize very efficiently and precisely. You can see that as we approach San Francisco, traffic becomes a little bit more dense, and our procession system is still able to track all of these vehicles smoothly. In stop-and-go traffic, it is important to predict the actions of other vehicles so that we can interact with them smoothly. The red gate in front of us indicates that we're slowing down while following the vehicle in front of us. Note again that when the video is sped up, this looks somewhat jerky, but it's actually very similar to what a human driver would do. In a few moments, the highway will end and we will enter San Francisco through King Street and then head toward the Embarcadero. The transitioning happens seamless. We don't have to stop and activate a new software or even load new parameters. We're always using the exact same software regardless of whether we drive in dense urban environments like SF or Las Vegas or on the freeway. Here's a situation we frequently see in the city. A biker splitting lanes shows up from behind. Now you can see what I mentioned earlier in the video about the white carpet. The biker's prediction gets considered when calculating our drivable space and we see some cutouts, which makes sense as we don't want to get too close to him. You can see that as we approach downtown there is much more activity all around us, however we are still able to track all of the pedestrians, vehicles and bikers around us accurately. It's important to also note places where we could improve. For example, the tram to our left is occluded and looks similar to a building, so we alternately perceive it as a vehicle and as a static obstacle. This is more likely to happen on objects that are further away or behind other objects, so it's less likely to affect agents that we will immediately interact with. However, we strive for correct scene understanding as much as possible and are always working to improve. Embarcadero, or Empacadero how I like to call it, is one of those streets with lots of stop and go. Obviously, you don't want to nod your head every time you come to a stop or take off, which is why we spend quite some time to implement smooth transitions from stop to go and go to stop. Sometimes it's just about the details.
Check out how narrow it gets here. With the curb on the left and the cars to the right, we sometimes really have to squeeze through the traffic. Our car is about the size of that black SUV in front of us and notice how close he gets to the white transporter right next to him. It is daily situations like these that mandate precise perception, prediction, planning and tracking. When the ambulance passes us on the left, you can see that we have it marked as a dynamic entity even though it's not actually on a mapped part of the road. We also use computer vision to classify which vehicles are emergency vehicles to be able to react to them appropriately. Our computer vision technology also enables our vehicle to classify other vehicle and pedestrian attributes such as open car doors, brake and indicator lights, which way pedestrians and vehicles are facing, and pedestrian actions such as whether a person is walking or running and whether they're looking at a phone and might be distracted. This, combined with the rest of our autonomous stack, ensures we have a thorough understanding of the environment surrounding us. Here's another great example of how our system is able to simultaneously track multiple dynamic objects all around us. You'll notice the mass of pedestrians in pink over towards the wharf and the cyclists moving past us. Now we're approaching our San Francisco headquarters and the end of the mission. You can see our vehicle go from white back to gray as we hand control back to the safety driver. 